Um, my name's Mike Gibbs, I'm an ecologist with Atkins and I'm the licence holder for the Great Christian Heat Mitigation Licence for the Junction 19 to 16 Smart Motorway scheme which is being constructed by Costane Gallup for Tri Joint Venture. And I'm going to talk today briefly about the Great Christian Heat and the mitigation we're employing on this scheme. We feed on invertebrates such as um, dragonfly larvae and tadpoles for a part for uh, frogs or other new tadpoles. They sometimes overwinter at the bottom of ponds, um, but they mainly overwinter on land, as we'll see. Hello, I'm Irfan Janaidi and I work for Thompson Ecology. I'm a graduate ecologist uh, working on the uh, Great Crest and Newt mitigation on the M1 um, motorway. Could you explain the differences between the species of newts out there? Certainly. So there are three native species of newts in the UK. We have smooth newts, palmate newts and great crested newts. Great crested newts are the, the rarest of the three. They're also the only large species of newt that we have in the country. Um, they're, they're also the most distinctive of the three. Uh, they grow up to about 15 centimetres, have dark, warty skin. They're also called the warty newt for that reason. Uh, white speckling along the flanks and very bright orange bellies with large dark spots. Um, so those are, the, those are the major differences. Obviously when they're in their aquatic form, the males have the very distinctive iconic jagged crest across their back and white stripe across their tail. So you can't miss them. These are suitable breeding ponds. So traditional farm ponds, which were always of a medium size, um, with good habitat around and didn't have too much uh, in the way of fish or uh, other waterfowl apart from maybe the old duck. These are ideal ponds of great use. Not too shaded, they were always kept open so that animals could feed and, and, and wash in them. They had some vegetation in them and the newts need the vegetation to lay their eggs. So medium sized ponds, not too shaded with some vegetation are ideal. Larger ponds, particularly fishing lakes, are not so suitable because some fish will eat the, uh, the new larvae. And on the M1 scheme between uh, junctions 18 and 19, where you've got several ponds, which are great Britain breeding ponds, and uh, these are the ones that we're concerned with, are the ones that are within 500 metres of the works because newts can move up that, that distance. They may move further, but Generally, they're within 500 metres of their breeding ponds. Terrestrial habitat is uh, woodland, scrub, rough grassland, and all these habitats are on the M1 verge. And as you can see from that photo, the M1 verge within 500 metres of breeding ponds is very suitable for great crystal newts. Now, as I said before, the adults will spend time in the terrestrial habitat in the winter and the juveniles will tend to spend two to four years there after they emerge from the ponds. There, they do use refuges to hide under and these would be typically stones, rubble, debris, logs and in the winter they'll hide down in burrows and crevices. What is the importance of uh, Great Crested Newts? So Great Crested Newts uh, are one of our European protected species. They've been, been given that designation uh, over the last century because of their rapid decline in this country due to um, intensive, intensive agriculture practices. Um, so they've been given that certain status in our legislation which uh, makes it illegal to disturb, capture, harm or kill them. Um, which is why we require licensing in order to actually capture and disturb them, in order to capture them and uh, translocate them to, uh, to safer receptor sites during projects like this. What is the importance of the need fencing? So during mitigation schemes like this, uh, we install what is called an exclusion fence, which essentially corners off the working area 
in which uh, we are meant to trap the newts. And so the fencing is uh, backfilled into the ground, which prevents anything from going in or out. And then around the inside of the fencing, we install uh, pitfall traps, which are essentially just buckets buried into the ground that are flush with the surface of the ground. Uh, they're vegetated, uh, floating. We also put out carpet tiles, which are about half meters to put in, just in case they get waterlogged. So anything that you know if it gets waterlogged, anything can like you know rest on the on the float that's in the refuge. Um, so that's essentially how we set up the fencing that just cordons off the working area and helps us capture the newts. And how do we survey for great crystal newts? Well, there's traditional methods which we've used for a few years now. These are low tech because they originated from volunteers doing Great Crystal Butte surveys, so they've used whatever they could find, whatever came to hand. And um, somehow, we don't know why, Great Crystal Butte and other Butte seem to enjoy swimming into plastic bottles if you put them in the water. So what they've been using is submerged two litre plastic bottles, attached to canes, and they put under the water. The canes will support them. You cut the top off, invert it and then you've got like a funnel trap you put the traps in overnight come back the next morning and check to see what you've got so we use these traditional methods for the first couple of years of surveys on the m1 uh, back in 2013-14 and in 2015 this spring this survey is a uh, seasonal so we have to do it at a particular time of year when the newts are in the pond which is in the spring generally between april and june new techniques of survey have come out and recently been approved, which involves a simpler method for presence absence of taking water samples from the pond. You take 20 water samples around the pond and then they're analysed for DNA. And this is called environmental DNA because it's basically fragments of DNA that come off great groups of as they're swimming about. You don't actually have to catch one, but you can catch the DNA in the water. Then approved laboratories will test for this and the results can come back within two weeks. If you still need to know the population size, you still need to do six visits under current uh, recommended guidance. That's using the traditional survey methods. Now research is ongoing to determine whether we can determine population sizes from just DNA, the amounts of DNA in the pond. Could you tell us a bit more about the trapping periods and also how the weather affects it? So depending on the license, what the license stipulates, uh, we can trap for any number of days. Uh, for this particular project, we're trapping for 25 days, which is based on the, uh, the moderate size of the Great Crescent Newt population that was estimated based on the previous study. Um, so that's 25 days of straight trapping every day from it has to happen before 11 o'clock in the morning uh, because we can't leave the animals in there for too long unless they might dehydrate or starve um, and uh, at the end of that period there has to be at least five clear days um, if any newts are captured within those last five days then we have to do another five days after that time um, so during that 25 days, uh, weather conditions can play a big part in that. Uh, we always check the minimum night temperature, which has to be at least five degrees. Any colder than that, and that's suboptimal. It's too cold for newts to actually uh, to go out and forage because newts are nocturnal. They, they feed during night, um, and uh, plus also it has to be there has to be some sort of moisture within the environment so rain is also a good sign the longer temperature um, so we keep an eye on all those different weather conditions and keep an eye on the number of suitable and unsuitable days so uh, when we talk about 25 trapping days that's 25 optimal days so the, uh, the weather conditions are very important when it comes to that so the license will allow us to undertake works which would otherwise be an offence there's three tests that Natural England will uh, apply when they're reviewing license applications. Just to, as a side, Natural England will deal with licenses in England, in Scotland and Wales, there'll be other bodies that will deal with them. So, on the M1 scheme, we've had these, uh, our application um, 
tested against these three tests, which as it says there, are the imperative reasons for overriding public interest, no satisfactory alternative, and the no detrimental effect on the population. So our scheme passes those three tests because of the mitigation we're putting in. Hi, my name is John Brand. I work for Thompson Habitat. I'm a site supervisor here at Costain uh, on behalf of Thompson Habitat. Um, we are installing, we installing new fence at the moment, which we have now completed to date. It took us two weeks and three days to complete the new fence. Hi, I'm Joe Solomons. I work as a site engineer for the Costain Gallifer Tri joint venture on the M1 Junction 19 to 16 project. Joe, could you tell us a bit about the work you've done around the new fencing and also how you oversaw Thompson's ecology team? It was part of my role to provide engineering support to Thompson Habitats whilst they were working on the project. Before Thompson started on site, there was a desktop exercise to establish what was required by the contract specification, what would be the scope of Thompson's works, how the work would be executed, and what engineering resources would be required. Once this was completed, the site team was able to ensure that the required information, materials and equipment was available to undertake the works. Before the contractor could start on site, the method statement was reviewed by the site team and approved for construction to start. Once these checks were complete, a request for traffic management was put in place, which in this case was a second row of cones with a lifeline, which gave Thompson's a safe working area in the job. When the contractor arrived on site for the first time, their team were inducted. This process ensures that all the necessary medicals, CSCS card checks and so on are in place and it gives them the site specific briefing for the risks that they will face when they go out on the project. Then they receive method statement briefings, driver inductions and their own subcontractor briefing before going out onto the site. It was part of my role to plan ahead of Thompson's setting out for the line, the line for vegetation clearance and providing permits to dig and answering any issues that occurred during the works. Throughout my, the works, my role was to observe and monitor the progress of the, uh, the new fence, recording the outputs and materials used, uh, and ensuring that the works complied with the method statement at all times. My final task was to do an on-site measure of the new fencing to confirm the exact amount installed. This was to ensure that the contractor was paid the correct amount for the work they had undertaken.